Hello there, and welcome into another edition of the J Max Snack. Today, I'm going to answer a question about Section 230. Have you heard about Section 230? I'm sure you have, because President Trump is threatening to veto the National Defense Authorization Act if he can't get some type of reforms for Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Now, you might be asking the question, what does the Decency Act have to do with the Defense Authorization Act? The answer is nothing. Squadoosh. The only thing they have in common is that President Trump wants to use one for leverage against the other. Yes, he's willing to put national defense on the line to get what he wants. He thinks that it's that important. So I thought I would take a few minutes and share with you exactly what is Section 230. Why doesn't the president like it? Does he have a point here? And should he be holding the Defense Authorization Act hostage? in order to get some type of repeal or reform of Section 230. So this is basically the president has been tweeting out that he's not going to authorize the NDDA unless he gets some type of reforms. He's tweeted that out at least twice. And then uh, Kayleigh McEnany was asked at the White House press briefing if he's serious about this. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, just one more question about Section 230. The Democratic chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, he put out a statement essentially saying that these two things are not related, Section 230 and something as big and important for our national security as the NDAA. So is, I just want to be clear here. Is President Trump seriously considering and talking about vetoing the NDAA over Section 230? Yes, uh, the president is serious about it. Um, and I noted, um, you know, when you have other world leaders that are making calls for genocide and Twitter not finding that worthy of flagging or blocking. Uh, beyond that, um, you look at China, who's putting out disinformation. China uh, tweeted out, uh, I believe it was six days ago, I think it was November 25th, that COVID-19 did not originate in Wuhan, something that was not deemed worthy of flagging by Twitter. Uh, there are real grave concerns here, and the president stands by that. Um, and it also is worth noting that the president will always defend our military, ensure that we get adequate defense funding as he's gotten $2.9 trillion so far, but he is going to put the pressure on Congress to step up on this. It is uh, pretty funny when you say the president is going to guarantee that the military always has funding when he's literally saying they're not going to get funding unless he gets this other thing that he wants. So I thought I would break this down for you. What is Section 230? Why do they want to change it? Should we actually reform it? Is this censorship? I have answers to all of those questions. So let's start out with what is this thing? What is Section 230? Here's, this was a pretty good explainer that I found on the interwebs. Section 230 is a tiny part of the Communications Decency Act that actually enables free speech on the internet today. This section says that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. It means that online outlets can host many kinds of content and they would not be legal owners of the content. That sentence alone allowed the big tech organizations like Wikipedia, Twitter, Facebook, and many more to exist. All right, so this is a big deal. This is what protects Facebook and Twitter and every other social media company out there from liability for things that their patrons or their users post. If you can imagine a world where Facebook was held accountable for every single thing posted, that would be a very tricky situation to navigate. So I wanted to find an expert for you, and I actually saw this interview. This is on Fox News Now with a law professor, Eric Goldman, with Santa Clara University. And I thought his explainer was right on. That's why I'm sharing it with you. The first question he was asked is, why do they want to change this Section 230? Yeah, you know, there's a wide range of critiques against Section 230, but most of them are ill-informed. Many of them want Internet companies to exercise what they'll call perfect moderation, to moderate all the things that the critic doesn't like and to allow all the content that the critic does like. The problem is we don't agree what content should be online and what content should be offline. 
And so there's always going to be disputes about whether or not internet services are doing it right because of the fact that no one actually agrees what right would look like. So when we hear discussions about things like removing Section 230, which both President-elect Biden and President Trump have, have said independently, um, they don't really understand what that means. What they're really saying is, we want to take a nuclear bomb and wipe out the internet. We want to take away all the things that are predicated on uh, services allowing us to talk to each other, and we want to shut it down. Um, and to me, that strikes me as something that, when people think about it that way, they're like, why would anyone want to do that? Why would President Trump say, you have to pick, either fund the military or eliminate the internet? That's the worst possible policy trade-off anyone could imagine. Yeah, I agree. It is a, a terrible policy trade-off. But again, what he's describing is the frustration, and the frustration has actually come from the left and the right, more so on the right, I believe, that their material is being flagged or it's being taken down. Uh, it's getting little captions added to it that this information can't be verified. And they want, or they live in this world, that somehow there is an independent arbiter out there who can deem the credibility of all things. And the only way that I can imagine this playing out is if you have a, a board, and it'd have to be a government board, that their job would be to, what, approve all content that goes on social media? Can you imagine? Uh, it, it's really just such a tall ask, and it's one of those things where when I've seen our legislators ask, you know, what are these reforms that you want from Section 230? It goes from getting rid of it all together to review boards to all of these different things. And I think that none of that is the correct answer. I'm actually a big fan of 230. Uh, it allows people to have this crazy thing called free speech. But then you're like, wait a minute, Jay, it's not free speech. They're taking these things down. Free speech doesn't guarantee you that you can have a free voice on Facebook or Twitter. Guarantees you that you can go outside and, I don't know, get on your soapbox and say whatever you want. So this attorney, Eric Goldman, was asked the question, should Section 230 be reformed? And listen to what he had to say. Well, there's always lots of opportunities to reconsider, did something work? And as you point out, we've had 25 years of experience. What's working? What isn't? These are all valid questions to ask. Those are not the questions our politicians are asking today. So any informed discussion about what problem exists, what the inputs are to that problem, and how we could calibrate a law to reduce those problems without collateral damage, that's well beyond the, the uh, skill set of our politicians in Washington, D.C. today. That's not the tenor of the discussion at all. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, reform, we have to ask the question, what problem are we trying to solve? What is the thing that we think isn't working? And would Section 230 reform improve that problem without collateral damage? Now, Congress did reform Section 230 just a couple of years ago in a law called FOSTA. It was a disaster. It absolutely counter was counterproductive to Congress's stated goals. It's a great cautionary tale. You have to be precise about the problem. And you have to make sure that Section 2 of the reform is the solution. Now, I know what you're saying. Jay, this is censorship. We can't allow censorship. Well, I have to tell you, it's not censorship. I've never seen it as censorship. I hate it when it's described as censorship. So I was anxious to find out from this law professor, am I on the right track here, at least in his opinion, when he was asked, is this censorship? It's a great question, and it's a, a good example of how we have to really be precise with our terminology, or else we end up really confusing matters. In my world, censorship is when the government imposes restrictions on free speech. When a private entity restricts speech, whatever that means, that's their editorial discretion. That's why newspapers don't publish every article that's submitted to them. That's why your publication, your broadcast, doesn't publish all the content that someone might submit to you. You decide in your own discretion what's fit for your audience. We call that editorial discretion. And what we've seen is this, in, this semantic jujitsu where people try to say that editorial discretion is censoring my speech. It's not the government censoring the speech. It's a, 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 publish, a, a private party deciding what's fit for its audience. 
and the efforts to reform Section 230 to try to either force sites to carry content they don't think is fit for their audience or to force them to remove content that might be constitutionally protected, that's censorship because the government's compelling it. So I hope we can all get past this word censorship because as he points out, censorship is when the government restricts free speech. When Facebook takes down one of your posts or you get kicked off of TikTok, that's not censorship in in the legal terminology. And it is protected under 230 and other laws. So you may be saying, well, Jay, what's the solution? Because clearly they're restricting conservative speech. Well, I've seen a lot of studies and research. They don't necessarily back that up. But I do think that there is a slant, and I will accept that. I will stipulate that there is a slant. But I also suggest to you that much of this has come about because of a president who is very loose with the facts. And so because his tweets and his posts so often contain blatant falsehoods, it's led these social media companies to want to put some clarification on there, lest they be seen as complicit in the information. So again, what is the solution? Well, we've seen the solution play out over and over again. And it's the beautiful part about our society and our government that if there's a need, that need can and will be filled. So, for example, what was the answer that emerged to an aggressively left-leaning media? Well, that answer was not to somehow force the media to change its tune or to have some special governmental board deciding whether or not they're left-leaning or right-leaning. The answer came in the form of Fox News, which appeared on the scene and attracted a very large audience and, and much higher viewership than a lot of the other media. And they presented a different perspective and they catered to a different listening audience. And yes, they slant right. They're not fair and balanced. They slant right. That's what they do. And that was the answer to CNN. And now, during this election, we've seen another answer emerge. Newsmax. Because people are frustrated. They even think the Fox News is slanted. And so you can see the market working to resolve this issue on its own. We saw another example with TikTok. As TikTok users were frustrated that their posts were being taken down. And so they rushed to a new app similar to TikTok called Parler. And suddenly Parler became this bastion for uh, conservatism, I guess, or right thinking people. Well, the CEO of Parler was asked what he th- what he thinks about the president's wishes to overturn Section 230. Yes. So Section 230 is actually a really nice thing because what it does is it protects small businesses um, from liability who are trying to compete with big tech. And so I just respectfully disagree in some extent, but I do think that, you know, he is um, the president at, you know, the clip you just played, he is on to something, right? This liability protection is being abused by big tech, but I don't think an outright removal of 230 is a good idea because it promotes competition and it actually helps the small guys more. You know, 230, uh, if it was removed, wouldn't have a big impact on companies with a large uh, financial balance, sh- uh, balance sheet like Facebook, Twitter, and even Parler. We would be okay, but any other competitor we get hurt the most. So he doesn't think it'd be a good idea. He does agree with the president that there is abuse. Uh, to me, the word abuse, you just can't look at that in a bubble. You have to, you literally have, you know, if the president says, look what percentage of my posts are being flagged or taken down. Well, you can't just say this many of this president and this many of the former president and say, see, they're slanted. You can't do it that way because this president is so different and he lies. And he lies more than any president that we've had. It's not even in dispute. And so would it be a shock that there are more corrections to what he posts? 
and more things taken down. I mean, the guy has retweeted conspiracy theories. He's retweeted misinformation. He's literally been asked about those retweets, and he says, it's a retweet. It's not an endorsement of the information. Okay, fine, whatever. But my friends, we're seeing perfect examples of how there, if there's a void, if there's too much of, of one thing, then this is a perfect opportunity. President Trump may be planning to start his own social media company on his own. And so he can raise awareness of Section 230 and get everybody kind of stirred up. Even though he's not planning on vetoing this bill, bill, I can't see him vetoing it. That would just, again, upset the military and challenge the belief that so many have that he is pro-military. But would any of us be surprised if he left with his hundreds of millions of dollars that he's acquired from his legal defense fund and, and other measures and started his own Facebook for conservatives? Or his own Twitter, uh, a way. And is there any doubt that millions of people would not rush to those platforms? And that would be the correct answer. And guess what? In that case, I guarantee you, he'll be very thankful that he has a Section 230 to protect him from liability. And I guarantee you that he'll lean on that instead of wanting to change it. So hopefully I've given you a little bit better understanding of Section 230, and hopefully I've encouraged you a little bit to not join the bandwagon saying that it needs to be changed. This will affect everybody adversely, and it would be much wiser to use the furor against Facebook and against Twitter and against Google to go out and push millions of people towards platforms that do it differently, that cater to a different group. What you're seeing here is a huge market opportunity. Parler taking advantage of that opportunity. So that would be my two cents. Hey, take a minute and scan that QR code that you see on the screen. If you like the information that I've brought to you, become a monthly patron of a dollar a month, five dollars a month, whatever you can do, or a one-time donation. Click on that, uh, take that QR code, or click on the link in the description. That will help me out to be able to bring you more of these JMAC snacks and live broadcasts on a regular basis. With that, more snacks to come. I hope you have a wonderful day.